1793, as the yellow fever plague raged through the streets of Philadelphia, doctors and citizens alike were forced to improvise. There was almost every kind of treatment regimen, plant and mineral substance, potion, and theory that you could possibly imagine. Two quarts of molasses might at this time Cover the floor of the sick room in fresh Wormwood earth. Wormwood and lavender have been affected. Be cheerful. None has yet appeared to compare with Delaney's aromatic vinegar. Most people receive their health care from their families. A doctor was a sign of last resort. And a lot of people were skeptical about doctors because they seemed to make their profit from human misery. They were above laborers, but below gentlemen. Doctors advertised their cures in the newspaper. One stripped the patient naked, threw three buckets of warm water on him, followed by three buckets of cold water, then wrapped him in a warm blanket and put him to bed. Dr. William Curry prescribed a tartar emetic to be taken in tea or barley water every half hour until vomiting, and a mild laxative such as wine or bark. The kind of treatment was still based on very, very traditional modalities going back literally to ancient Greek medicine. There were certainly two schools of thought about exactly how to do it, although they overlapped. On one side was a group of physicians led by Curry, and they really believed in a kindler and gentler approach to treatment of yellow fever. Hydration, rest, lying in a dark room, wine, and other very gentle remedies were used uh, in order to allow the body to heal itself. And then there was Dr. Benjamin Rush, who believed in heroic measures. These would usually include first using a mercurial agent, something like castor oil or calomel or mercury salts, to purge the bowels of their contents. After purging, often a patient would be warmed, wrapped in blankets, um, so that they would perspire. And finally, after that, they would be bled. These are tools that Dr. Rush used, some say to excess. This is a bleeding bowl and a spring lancet. This spring lancet has a cutting blade. This lever on the side releases the blade and it plunges down into the vein. Patient puts the arm in the bowl to catch all the blood and you bleed into the bowl until the doctor figures you bled enough that he binds up your wound and sets you on your way. Rush believed that yellow fever was a, a vigorous, fierce disease and you really need to treat it with vigorous, fierce, depleting measures that you, you, you couldn't stand by and watch. This is a syringe. Dr. Rush and his fellow physicians all use this. You would load very harsh medicines that were purgatives, calomel or mercury, and JLAP. And with a plunging action, you would expel it through the nozzle into the rectum or the urethra. These would induce diarrhea in abundance. Rush's critics called him a murderer essentially, and it seems impossible that Russia's aggressive bleeding and purging didn't make things worse for his patients, if not kill them. I would also argue that those actors might raise their hands and say, no, let me explain where we're coming from, and this is what they would say. The body is actually made up of something called humors. Basically, it's this system of fluids when one of these fluids gets out of balance, and you need to balance it somehow. So you need to feed the body something that's gonna get them to sweat and sweat out the bad humor, or something that's gonna make the person throw up, just to get it out, essentially, and to restore balance. Benjamin Rush himself, when he became ill, also requested to be treated with bleeding and purging. And he survived, and partially as a result of this, he fervently believed in and advocated for heroic measures. Dr. Jean Devez, the chief doctor at the city's Yellow Fever Hospital, challenged Rush's methods. He is not alone. Dr. Devez conducts post-mortem autopsies of the people who die. He also sees in these autopsies the effects of mercury poisoning. And this work that he publishes 
becomes a basis for scientific study later on. Each thought the other was killing patients, and they said so. And Rush thought that anybody who ignored his treatment was foolhardy and was going to increase the mortality. Others argued that what Rush was doing was unprecedented, was intolerable, and was going to help depopulate the city and spread the nation and the world. It's bad enough to the point that you actually get groups like Benjamin Rush breaking off from the College of Physicians, and he forms his own little academy, the Academy of Medicine, and he draws around him a circle of former pupils, like-minded scholars, who start setting up their own publications, their own committees to actually promote their own views. In 1793, no one, not Benjamin Rush, not William Curie, understood how yellow fever worked. As the epidemic continued, through the summer and into the fall, Philadelphians fired guns and cannons into the sky, trying to destroy the malady that terrorized them. In the end, only the changing seasons would rid the city of the mosquitoes that were the unknown source of the disease. And in the years that followed, they would return.